the internet, through Facebook, and through some of you guys and gals. And so we're going to go through this in more of an interview type style. But the uh, added bonus to this is it's going to be Facebook Live. So uh, we're going to try to get this out there to the masses. Uh, following Jenny Rob's presentation yesterday, we have to do a better job of promoting not only ourselves and our programs, but also the brand of USPTA and then us as coaches. So that's why we're going to try this. It may shut down the internet. We don't know. Uh, anything could happen at this point. But uh, how are we doing there with our technical? We are. We're, we're, ready, ready, to we're ready to go. Um, so um, if there's no questions, we're going to get this show rolling. Uh, I just want to start by saying this is really weird. <laughs> I haven't done this interview style before, and, and I, there's a big dose of humility in me right now saying, what are we doing? Um, this, doesn't, this feels very awkward. Uh, so Bill asked me to do this in this format because it is something a little unique, and, and we don't necessarily innovate a lot in our industry. So we wanted to just try this and see how it went. And feel free to raise your hand and ask anything. Totally open season. And I know, if I know Bill, he's probably got some very strange questions coming up. <laughs> so we want this to be interesting uh, for, for you and those who may be watching uh, on, on the internet as well. Uh, and if you want to stream it or post about it, we want you to do that. We highly encourage you to do that. So we're going to dive into the first question. Uh, first off, with Craig Signorelli uh, here with us um, up from Tampa. Uh, through Atlanta and via Malibu. So, uh, as you guys know, yesterday uh, he's got a wealth of knowledge and been around the game for a long, long time. So, Craig, this is top ten questions. Um, and the first one is, came to us, um, you've got uh, younger kids in clinic. How important is it to have older kids who have been through your program in and around those courts so that the younger kids can see the older kids and vice versa. Yeah, I think it's critical. Um, you know, we, we, so many of us learn tennis watching television and watching our role models uh, and trying to emulate what they do. And I think what you're seeing in the game today is the role models are all kind of the same style. They're all playing the big aggressive baseline game and that translates down to what you're seeing with the younger kids. Right. They're doing what their role models are doing. Back you know, 20 years ago you had a lot of serve volleyers and the kids would do that. So obviously it's a I do what I see game. Um, and so having your high performance players next to your six year olds, seven year olds, eight year olds is critical. Right. They've got to see where am I going with my game. They're going to try the trick shots. They're going to try to hit the ball bigger and with more depth and with more shape when they see what it's supposed to look like by the older kids that, that are the role models. Right. And in addition to that, I would say that the more we can introduce character traits of mentoring and taking care of those younger kids by having the older kids work with the younger kids, come by and just pat a little guy on the head and say, great job, right? right? Um, the more we can connect five-year-olds or 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds who have been through the process, who can advise them, the better off we're going to be as a sport. It's going to save the lifeblood of what we do. Right. And kind of as a follow-up to that, how does that factor in when you deal with the parents uh, being able to see little Timmy over there, who's now big Timmy at 16, um, still as a part of that. Does it help? Yeah, I, of course. I mean, you're, you're promoting your program when you're marketing your high-level kids to the younger-level kids. You're showing the parents the successes that you've built in your program. Um, you are keeping the connection of older and younger generations. Right. And, you know, I, I think if, if a kid has stayed with the program eight to ten years, it says something special about the coaching mentor relationship that goes on at that place. And I think it's great marketing for that program. Um, so, moving on, um, we know that kids probably are not playing enough matches uh, across the board. So, is there a formula or what's your take on how much match play should they have? Practice match play, competitive match play in say a week or a month compared to private lessons, group lessons and those type things? Well, there's, there's a lot of studies out there that kids should be on the court approximately the same time as, as their age. So nine hours if they're nine years old, 12 hours if they're 12 years old. Um, but when I grew up, um, I'll never forget Elliot Telcher uh, telling me, he was top five in the world, and he said that when he grew up, he would play 30 to 35 sets a week. And then we go out and they play five sets a day, and then on the weekend they go play 10 sets with their buddies. And he said, through that you learn the game. Um, obviously the game's a little bit more physical now, and we probably can't put that workload on, on the players. But 
a lot of these kids today are drilled to death and lessened to death, and you know they're they're working one on one and they're in development situations, but they're not in play situations, right? And so much about this sport is adaptation and, and figuring out how to win and figuring out strategies and and how do I decipher that opponent? And if you're not put into a competitive situation, um, you're not really getting exposure to that. And so for me, you know. I follow, there's, there's a guy named Robert Lansdorf in California who's worked with a lot of great players. He says, one lesson a week, I tell him what to work on, and then go do it. Right. And whether it's repetitions that they're doing or going to play 10 to 12 sets and, and implementing those things, you know, I kind of buy into that philosophy. It should be, I like like an 8 to 1, 10 to 1 ratio of, of set play to lessons. Right. <clears throat> and so the follow-up to that would be, well, then how? Because they say, well, I, you know, I'm waiting on mom to take me home. I don't have a ride. Uh, we don't have the club rat kids who kind of hang out at the club anymore. Yeah. So how do I get them to play more matches? I think players who want to do well uh, will eliminate those excuses very quickly. It's very easy to say I couldn't find someone. It's very. It's also very easy to come up with a list of 20, 25 kids that are in your area, whether they're high school kids, uh, adults who want to play with them, find a college hitter, uh, find five friends and go out and play sets where the kids aren't even as good as you, it doesn't matter, but you're working on something, Right. call that list all 20 names until you find someone who can play that week and then start the next name and go through the list again every week. There's a lot of ways where I can't do it. I can't, I can't get through this. It's, there's no way for me to solve this problem. But the ones who are going to succeed are the ones who have the persistence to go do it. Um, and kind of as a follow-up to the follow-up, could uh, how, what's your take on kids playing against adults? At the club, I love it. You know, some of the some of the problems with that are the kids and the parents will say, "Well, that adult plays the slicey game, the drop shot game. They play differently than the kids will actually see in tournaments." Right. But because tennis is so much about adaptation and figuring out how to solve problems on the court, you know, those kids are going to have to deal with the slice and the drop shot at some level, at some point in their development. And so, um, I think exposure to all of that, exposure to I'm playing someone who is older than me and is putting pressure on me to win, or there's no way I can beat this person, and feeling that emotional pressure. Um, there's a lot of things that go along with, with playing players better than you, players worse than you, and players at your level. And I think the kids should have exposure to all of those, and, and the age really doesn't matter. Um, and keep in mind, these questions came from a lot of you, as well as uh, people that wrote in. So, number three, uh, Craig, why did you get into coaching tennis? <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's kind of a strange story. Uh, when I was 19 years old, uh, I was a witness in a really, really famous murder case uh, in California. And as a witness in the case, I had a, a legal bill. I had to hire an attorney uh, to be involved in this case. And to pay that legal bill, my only skill at 19 years old was growing up as a tennis player. And so I started teaching lessons to literally pay the attorney so it could keep me, walk me through that, that trial as a witness. Um, and so for, God, I mean, I started with doing lessons for 10 bucks an hour and clinics, just filling in when I could. Right. And it took me a long time to pay off that legal bill. Um, and the trial lasted six years, so. But uh, yeah, I started working with kids at that point and we fell in love with it. Had one little girl who did extremely well from the beginning. I had high energy, high intensity, but I didn't know what I was teaching. Um, and then as she got better, I had to stay ahead of her in her development. So I started reaching out to the top coaches around the area. And fortunately, they would take their time and work with me and, and mentor me. And um, as I did that, my breadth of knowledge got more and more. Right. And I started seeking out more and more knowledge from the best. And uh, 30 years later, I'm still doing it. I still love it. Yeah. So if there's a, a young coach out there that hasn't witnessed a murder, but we want to get them into tennis, um, how do we get more and more young coaches into 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 coaching tennis and, and staying with it? Because we, we know that we're limited on our number of U30s. Yeah, they say the average age of tennis coaches now is well over 40. Um, our sport our sport needs a little jolt. Um, you know, you watch the NFL promote their sport on TV, and it's high action, fast music, uh, super athletic plays. We watch tennis promoted on TV, and it's still a lot of take a lesson with your local pro. 
and it's very stiff and traditional, and we're getting a little bit better, um, but it's not exciting for a 19-year-old kid to come out and say, I'm, I'm going to be a tennis coach. Right. Right? There's just so many other options these days. Um, so I think part of it's in the promotion of the sport, and the other part is you know, we have a lot of coaches in this room who work with a lot of kids who are getting to be 17, 18, 19 years old, and I think it's our responsibility to talk to the kids about what this career offers. And right. You can make a lot of money at it, you can affect a lot of people, and you can travel the world. Um, and to be inspiring to generations of kids, I think is a huge benefit. But I, I don't think we translate that well to the next generation. We just do our job and develop them. Right. And we help those character traits, and then they go on and do awesome in their lives. But to throw this out as an option, I don't know that we do that enough. Maybe sell the cool factor a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, you could be Bill Riddle. <laughs> uh, nobody wants that. Um, so you've got um, a program at your club, and so kids are coming to you that you really didn't develop. Um, kind of how do you evaluate <laughs> you yourself as a, as a coach when you've got the kids you're trying to develop versus the kids that maybe come in from somewhere else? Is is that important, or how, how do you? What's your take on that? Well, I think so. There's a lot of programs that have systems, um, and someone comes in from the outside, and you have to make a decision whether that kid, you're going to make that kid fit into your system, or you're going to allow the, for the individualism of that player to come in. And so that that I think is the first decision you make. Right. Um, do, do I mold this kid into what I know, or do I take the genetics and, and body and competitive personality of this kid and adapt to what that kid needs? So that's number one. So that, that's the first assessment I would make. And then um, the next thing is going to be, you're going to hear from that kid, well, my coach before told me something different. And that's a hard conversation to have because you don't want to belittle another coach, right? and you may have a disagreement on it. So I think. When I do that initial assessment, it's going to be, let's set up a developmental plan and make sure we're on the same page, uh, and make sure that, that that kid's vision of what that game is going to look like three or four years down the road is the same as mine. Right. And then a conversation with the parents, because that kid left the program for a reason, and I want to know why. Right. What were the mistakes that, that the other coach made, or what skills didn't they have, uh, or what were they developing in that player that made that player leave? I don't want to hear that we're coming to your program because you have success. That scares me because that means there's another program out there that's going to have success and that kid's going to jump again at some point. I want to know that the parents' reason for bringing that kid was we're coming to your program because we see the way you develop players and that's what we're looking for for this kid. So how much time would you spend then with the parents getting them to understand where you're coming from? Because a lot of times it's easy to get the kid. It's really difficult to get the parents sometimes. Yeah, I, I think every kid has a driving force behind them, but most of the time that's one parent who's the driver. And I think an co initial conversation with that is, is critical. Um, you know, I've turned away a ton of kids because the initial conversation with the parent, just we weren't on the same page and I, I saw problems coming up in the future. Right. And I want to make sure that every kid and every parent in the program understands exactly what we're trying to do and is on that page. And if somebody's going to be require too much work to right. manage, I'm probably not going to take that kid in the program and I'll, I'll promote somebody else's program for that kid. Um, but, but I think that initial conversation. And that's at every level. Because yeah. we had a, that conversation the other day, it doesn't matter if it's at your club or on the tour, there has to be the right fit. Yeah, yeah I've traveled with players. My, my wife is the, the WTA psychologist and you know, she talks about some of the issues on tour. and and. Even up to, to top 50, top 20 in the world, there's still really, really tough parents who are driving the kids incredibly hard to be the breadwinner of the family. And you know that's a pressure that started at six years old for that kid. And along the way, no coach kind of intervened and, and redirected that to help the kid's career. Right. So they're still suffering it at 25, 26, 27 years old. It's tough. So along the lines of coaching, what's the difference between a teacher and a coach? In your, in your opinion? Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, 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 for me, the, the relationship is different. The teacher is talking more about technical things, about maybe little tactics uh, that start a kid's game. And I think a coach looks at 
kind of a macro perspective, a global perspective for the kid, and, and what is that competitive personality? What's that kid's background? What's their, what are their genetics? How big are they going to be? What's their brain type? Um, and getting a sense of this kid's character and, and physicality and competitive mentality. And when you understand all of that, you can say, okay, I understand what this person's game is going to look like down the road. And as a coach, you're dealing with psychology, you're dealing with the kid going through school, you're mentoring that person as a human being. Um, you, you're probably setting up travel schedules around the world. Right. Uh, you're setting up training blocks, you're working with the trainers, you're working with um, nutritionists and, and all parts of the team. You're bringing in other coaches to help assist in areas where you're weak. Whereas I think the teacher's role is to instill a love of the game, uh, is to introduce the basics and, and give a foundation so that kid then says, I love what I'm doing, I want to be a tennis player, I need to go get a coach. So both critical roles. Right. If that foundation is not set, there's no one to coach. And if that foundation is set and the kid has more ability than that teacher will allow, then it's time for the coach. So I, I think the initial coaches in this country don't get enough credit at all. Right. Um, those foundation kids, what Scott, Scott Mitchell was doing a session this morning, um, Scott's doing unbelievable work setting up hundreds of kids through the Red Orange Green program, and those kids are coming out with a knowledge that high-performance coaches will take those kids and say, yes, the base was done properly, thank goodness, and Scott's probably not rewarded in that thing because that kid's not winning tournaments at that age. Right. Well, uh, you said something that made me think of my question, because I didn't have one of these ten, but you, you just said, well, you want to bring in other coaches to help you uh, with maybe a player or a group of players. A lot of times, tennis coaches are very much, look, this is my show, uh, I'm the one driving this, and I really don't want anybody else's feedback. How important is that, and, and how do you get to the point of the coach to say, you know what, I need some help with this? Because there's a big, there's a lot of ego sometimes. So how do we manage that? Um, I was one of those ego coaches when I was 20 years old. Um, you know, we, we think we know the world. We played through juniors. We oh, I know what I'm doing. And I went to Indian Wells um, and sat, and I was in the owner's booth, and this little guy rolled up in a wheelchair next to me, and he started talking, and I had no idea who he was. And we're watching Roddick that day, Nadal, and Federer. This guy's talking and going, this guy going to serve here, he's going to do this, this shot going to go here, he's going to do, okay, going to double fall right now. And for six hours, the guy was right every single time. And his, I found out his name is Pancho Segura, uh, who is one of the elite strategy coaches on the planet, and Grand Slam winners. And, um, and my ego went just from here, <laughs> crashing through the floor, and I said, I, I know nothing. Right. Um, and so that was a really good lesson for me that even he said that he was still talking to people and learning as, as he was watching matches. He leaned over to Charlie Passarell and he said, Charlie, what do you see? Right. And he, this guy's you know, a million times smarter than, than I've ever been on a tennis court. Right. And he's asking for advice. And so that made it very simple for me to say, as I go along this, this path, I'm going to seek out mentors and seek out people who know more because the game, there's just so much to our game. Right? I mean, we have technical specialists, we have athletic specialists, we have forehand and backhand specialists, we have serve specialists. You, the, Sean Drake is here right now um, talking about new technology to check joint stability and mobility and, and making sure the athlete is sound that you can build things on. So to, to say that you can master all of those facets of the game, right? Um, pretty hard in today's world. There's just somebody out there who's probably better, and if you want to do the best for the kid and maximize that kid's potential, give that kid access to the better coach. Well, it's been said that you probably should go back and give uh, all the money that you made off of teaching lessons your first two years as a coach, uh, because you, you think you know all these things, but you really, really don't. Um, do you subscribe to that? I mean, I mean, not that we're going to give the money back. <laughs> so let's be clear. Nobody's getting any money back, right? But um, you, talk, you touched on that earlier. Yeah, I think we, we, not only do we learn from the other coaches, but we learn from the kids every day. Right. I mean, if you're out there in the trenches, and this is why I like the developmental coach at the 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 year old level, they're out there tossing hundreds of thousands of balls a year and trying to get the technique right, trying to get it right. And while they're doing that, they're solving problems 
for hundreds of different kids. Right. And every time they solve a problem, they become a better coach. And so the more demographics you ask access, you're working with older people, with men, with women, with kids, um, with, I've, I've worked with uh, kids in wheelchairs, right. uh, work with autistic kids, and to approach the problems that they have to solve means that you've got to think your way through things in a whole different way. And when you expand your knowledge that way, you can apply it to all the different demographics. So, as you said, we're probably not going to give the money back, but right. definitely a debt of gratitude to, to all the kids who work with and, and all the coaches who have had influences. So, maybe as I follow up to that, um, and I, I know I experienced this with, with my two kids, my son and daughter, when they were playing soccer and baseball and other sports. Um, what can we take from other sports or other coaches that are not in tennis? What do you look for, or do you do it yourself uh, when going back to tennis and helping your athletes? You can read the books. Timothy Galway, Cal Galway wrote The Inner Game of Tennis, uh, The Inner Game of Golf. You can look at uh, the way Kobe's work ethic in the gym applies to what we're doing. If you listen to the top athletes in the world, they're all kind of the same in that they have an incredible work ethic and discipline to, to toward mastery. Right. Um, and you listen to the coaches, uh, Phil Jackson from the Lakers, Shosevsky at Duke, and, and I think John Wood is a great example of setting up kind of how how champions look in the early years, in the formative years, and, and when they become champions, right. and how things don't change much. Their, their humility is there, their work ethics is still there, they still want to improve every day. And so I think if you listen to champions and surround yourself with with the people who have excelled in their sport, it's why there's a podcast with Tim Ferriss. He interviews the elite people in their fields. Um, TED Talks are the elite people in their fields. And all of that information tells how high performance people do in the world. And I think the more you access that, the more you get an understanding of what do I want to do as a person and what, what traits do I want to pass on to the next generation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. Did I answer the question? <laughs> Okay, um, so here's a, a good one that came in. What's the next evolution in the sport of tennis? Um, I, I think the game's going toward analytics and statistics a lot more. Um, you know, tennis is about 10 years behind golf in, in how we address our sport. They were doing video analysis and, and technical analysis to a much higher level about a decade ago. Right. Uh, and I think as, as the statistics come in, um, you're going to see more coaching go based on those statistics. You know, Craig O'Shaughnessy at, at Brain Game is, is doing things where he's saying how that the 70% of the points are done in the first four shots, but also starting to show the patterns on the court, right. uh, where shots are hit. I, I think that the next ball machine in the future will probably be, you can insert Rafa's French Open into the ball machine, and then You'll have those the spins and shots that Rafa hit, and then you'll be on this side hitting, and there'll be lights on the other side of the court that will light up where Djokovic responded, or where Federer responded, and can you hit that ball to that target? I can imagine that being the game of the future. So you're saying this is something that Stan Oli and Playmates working on right now? Exactly. Anybody who knows Stan? Or, or, or virtual reality type stuff. I right. know kids are starting to train in virtual, virtual reality machines. Um, where you're playing Federer, you're playing Rafa, right. and you're increasing your speed, you're increasing your processing speed, so you can play professional level tennis at the youngest age without necessarily feeling the impact on your body. Um, they're doing now putting sensors on the body and trying to find out the ideal heart rate, and the ideal blood flow, and, and it's just getting more technical, right. uh, or more high tech, technological, and I think that's probably the future of the game. Yeah. You see Battle Lab dabbling now with the play racket. Right. They're, they're trying to get more information to the athletes. And for those of you who don't know, on the WTA, um, they give out iPads to the coaches now. And they get live updates as the match is going on. The coaches are sitting there in the stands before they go on court to do their talks with the ladies. They've got every analytic you can imagine um, at their fingertips as the match is going. So I think that's where we're probably going to go as coaching community. And right. the goal is for that to trickle down to all of the country clubs so we can get the analytics as quickly as possible. So kind of a, as a follow-up to that, is there something that the club coach could do to maybe start to get at, into that or ahead of that curve? I mean, with it, whether it's uh, uh, you know using their iPhone or just videoing serves or ground strokes or whatnot, is there something that this group could take home and go, 
I'm on top of it now. You know, I think coaches are doing it. We have the iPhones out. We're doing video analysis of the kids. We have there's tons of apps out there where you compare it to the pro players and model your kid next to the, the professional player and shows the differences. Um, but I think just keep looking online for for information. I think more analytics are coming out. More websites and apps are coming out there to, to show you how the game is played at the higher level. And there's just more information. Right. And I don't have specific answers because I'm still doing my research right. as well. Um, but I do know that as a learner, I was never visual. I was always verbal. So when someone showed me a picture, it didn't help me much. And I never understood that there were different ways to learn. Right. But when I found that out, and 80% uh, of people are visual, yeah, suddenly I started using the phone a lot more. Well, um, you know, last night we got to, to, to listen to Taylor Dent, and he uh, dazzled the crowd with a couple of big serves, like right off the airplane. Um, but uh, this one actually came in from Dan and Charlotte. Uh, what progressions uh, would you use to teach the serve, especially to a, a, you know like an inexperienced player that's coming up? To me, uh, we always start with throwing. I mean, if a kid can't throw and do this over the head, it's a problem. There's just there's so many kids now who do this growing up, right? They're all unbelievable with their thumbs, and if you could serve with their thumbs, they'd all be better. Um, but Kids today, they don't really kick, catch, throw, climb trees, ride bikes. And so the basic athletic skills are lacking. And so development with me would be start with being able to throw a ball. Right. Then make, start making contact above the head, make the racket and ball touch, have someone toss it up there. Uh, I like balloons up there to start with the younger kids, just getting them used to being above their head, catching balls up in here. Um, so we throw baseballs, we throw footballs, we throw tennis balls on the red court. Um, and then, you know, Taylor did a, a good example yesterday of the things that were important on the serve. Right. So I won't go through it, but uh, you know, there's there's 50 websites <laughs> that break the serve down step by step, and, and I think right now Mark Kovacs probably has the best best explanation of how to build a serve from the ground up. He's got a seven or eight step process, and he's one of the leading biomechanics scientists out there. Right. So if you're going to look for information, like I said, I can do it pretty well, but I'm going to go seek out the best, and I think that's the best example right now. But bottom line is, and I look back at kids myself, how many kids are out just in the backyard throwing and catching anymore uh, versus five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, um, getting them out there throwing balls? Yeah, it's, it's different. We're, we're in a completely new generation. It's video games. It's, it's apps on the phone. And... And I think that that's why many sports are, are starting to falter. You know, we don't we don't see enough kids with the basic athletic development. I think a, if anybody's interested in a good entrepreneurial venture, schools for kids learning basic athletic development, three, four, five years old. I think if there were those all over the country, um, the status of our sports would increase. And, and plus, we're now competing against the world, right. right? I mean, information is so easy to access. Everybody on the planet has can get it. And so the rest of the world is catching up in all of the sports because they can access the info that we have. And we're live in three other countries right now. <laughs> uh, and Kentucky is not one of those countries. Uh, all right, so last question uh, from our 10 that came in, and then we're going to open it up because we have a few minutes. Um, so yesterday you talked a lot about the patterns and ground strokes. How do you start to incorporate serve and volley into what you do as a coach and, and your teaching methods? Well. For like I said, the kids are emulating what they see on TV, and they rarely see serve volleyers. So most, some kids don't even know that's a part of the game until they're 13, 14 years old, where they can actually try it. You know, the coach says, hey, we should serve volley now, and I've had kids literally say, what is that? Um, they think it's serve and then stop and run to the net and do some volley work. So you know, I, I think probably starting on the orange ball court, um, you start introducing it. We do. There's a great story about Rafa. I think it's in the paper today, that said, Uncle Tony said, Rafa, you need to serve a volley this match. You're on clay. I need you to serve a volley every point, and it's okay if you lose. And they had an argument about it, and Rafa went out and did it, and Uncle Tony said, Rafa lost the match, and Uncle Tony said, that was exactly what I needed you to do because it proved that you trusted me, and we can now have a working relationship that is going to be successful in the future because I know you'll come out of your comfort zone to do what I say. And I think that was really interesting take on how a high-level coach works with a player. Right. That trust relationship has to be there. And so 
we can do that with younger kids, and maybe we change the idea of results. Maybe the result is, I serve and volleyed 50 times, I won. Right. Not necessarily go by score. But I think that has to be introduced at the youngest age until they get comfortable with it. It takes time. I spent a little time with John McEnroe, um, and he, he was working out in a program that we were running a few years ago. And Max said it's probably a 10 to 15 year process to really understand positioning and what to look for on the other side of the court for serve volleyers. So if we start them at age 14, they're probably going to be done with their career before they understand it. Start them at age 7, by the time they're just before the peak of their career, right. they've got a sense of how it works. So I think it's, it's critical to get them started at a young age. Good. Well, that's our 10 questions. We'd like to open it up to anybody that's got questions out there. In the back, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Um, my question is, um, I, I mean, I, I love I love this whole presentation, but uh, I, so I'm very curious as to how you address with the parents the long-term kind of progression because our society, I feel like, is everyone wants now, 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 now. We want to win right now. You know, why, why is my kid not winning this tournament? And we're doing all this. And you're talking about long term versus short term. Um, even something like a serve and volley, which is a skill that's very useful, but maybe they're not going to win right now. So, how do you address that with your program? So, can we review the question? Sure, yeah. The, the, the question was how do you convince parents that long term development is more important than instant gratification? My, my kid needs to win today. And obviously, all of the coaches, we all face that. Um, <laughs> Obviously, that initial conversation is going to be about we're doing a long-term process based on what your kid's going to look like at 18 years old. One of the first things I do with kids when they come on my court is I say, 8, 9, 10 years old, I say, I want you to close your eyes, imagine yourself in the quarterfinals of the U.S. Open, okay, and you're going to play a point. But before they do that, keep your eyes closed. I want to know what you're wearing. Is it sunny or foggy? I want to know what, uh, what brand you're playing with, what brand of racket you're playing with. And I'll need to play a four or five shot point. And what does that look like? And it makes the kid have an awareness of what they want to look like in eight years or so. And we say, now I want to keep that picture in your head every single day until we get to that point. And so it establishes a long-term goal. And I normally do that with the parents on the court also, because they generally go through the same process. Um, but as another answer to your question is, there's very little correlation between a number one 10 and 12 year old and the number one 18 year old. Most of the times winning at 10 and 12 years old is done by keeping the ball in play, pushing the ball down the middle, and taking very little risk. Um, and what happens is they get comfortable winning, they don't want to come out of their comfort zone as they get better, so they stick with that game because it's, it's led them to success, and they don't evolve into having the bigger, more aggressive game that they might need at a higher level. The kids who are 10, 11, 12, 13 years old who are doing more things and not necessarily worried about the winning will have a more complete skill set and probably have more success in the future. Now, it's not always true, but if we're playing the odds, I'm going to go with the more complete skill set who's tried more things and come out of the comfort zone for his, his or her entire career rather than the kid who says, I'm going to stick with one thing. It's a neutral game played with shots that don't necessarily look like what's on tour. Does that help answer? Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Question. So we had a lot of conversation about the player, uh, coach, parent relationship, and how important that is. Who, who do you think? Do you think there's somebody out there who has the best model for how that relationship gets developed? That's probably a really neglected part of our profession. I think. So player, parent, coach triangle. Who's, who's doing the best or leading the way? You know, I mean, it, I, I've heard people talk about it before, but it, you know, it, is there somebody out there who you think has a really good model for developing that relationship? Because if any one of those three are on a different page, yeah. then things get really skewed. So, yeah. no, I wish I did. I wish I had an answer for you. Um, I think Samper's model was interesting. His parents came to watch him win to break the record. Other than that, they said we hired a coach because we believe in the coach. And that's the person we want developing our kid because we've done our research and trust that that person will be responsible for successful development of our kid. And we're going to stay out of the picture and just enjoy what our player does. Um, Richard Williams had unbelievable success with his model, right? Uh, I, I don't think there's a model that anybody said this is the way to develop champions. Um, I, 
though you'll hear a lot of people say that they have the right model, but yeah, I, I, there's nothing that I can point to that says this is absolutely the way to do it, where it's guaranteed to have success. Sorry. Yeah, and, and, and even even more than just having success is just you know making sure everybody's on the same page. You know, regardless of where that whether that takes you to being a great high school player, uh, being able to play in college, or being a pro. You know. Getting everybody on the same page. Yeah, you know, for me, it comes down to communication. It's initial conversations. It's you have to bring the parent into the equation from day one. But one, I, one of the coaches doing the lectures the last couple of days said that they bring the parent on the court and include them in conversations all the time because they want to. I think Taylor said it. He wants to address the problem of how the parent interacts with the kid, and if there's anything that comes up with the language that they use or the mental approach that they use, he wants to be able to intervene and say that's not what we're doing, and make sure everyone's on the same page. So. I try to do the same thing, include parents all the time. Some coaches don't want to deal with the parents. They want to be left in the hands of, uh, left in their own hands to make decisions and tell the parents to stay out of it. I'm the coach, I know everything. And that may work also. You know, again, the Sampras model works. But for me personally, it's I'm including the parents. They care about their kid, they want the best for their kid. Right? Start with that. They may not have the information that we have about the process because we've been doing it with many kids for many years. So if you educate them, hopefully that will get them on the same page. Two more questions. Here. Uh, how important do you believe it to be having multiple different services at your club? Or if not at your club, but training your players, developing them on clay, grass, hard, so they get a taste of them? The question is about multiple surfaces and training on multiple surfaces. Um, as I said earlier, tennis is about adaptation and being able to solve problems on the court. And so higher bounces, lower bounces, different, different size split step for the different surfaces, keeping your body higher and lower, um, different types of game styles. You're going to see a little more serve rally on grass when it's faster. Uh, the clay, you're going to get a higher bounce, right? You're going, to, you're going to be hitting behind a little bit more. You're going to be hitting a few more drop shots. So there's, there's strategic and tactical problems that you're going to learn by playing on different surfaces. There's physical things that are going to change playing on different surfaces. And each one of those teaches the player how to adapt better and how to solve problems. So I think the more exposure you have to the different surfaces, the better. Uh, there was a match played many years ago between Federer and Nadal, and half the court was grass and half was clay. And you could just see them. I mean, they had to change shoes every time they switched sides of the court. And you could see them just, how am I going to solve these problems? Because it, it flips so fast. And they played a, a decent match. It wasn't the best tennis. But very cool to watch how quickly these players will adjust their games based on surface. And so if it's good enough, or if, it, if you see them being able to do it, um, I think if we can teach our kids to do it very early on, it's probably a good thing. One more. Craig, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, we have an academy sort of set up where we have sort of different levels and promoting a kid from, from a you know, uh, intermediate class to the advanced class and so on. We sort of like all sat down as coaches and almost had like a draft. You know, and then you get the parent that says, well, yeah, but but my kid beat that kid, you know, that's up there in that class now. What are your thoughts on like, how, how do you sort of say, I think you're ready for, for another level? Yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's a bunch of approaches to that. Um, if you make it subjective, if you say the coach gets to decide, you're going to have arguments all the time. Because one kid might beat a kid five times, but because that one kid is just pushing the ball in and the other kid is taking risks and looks a million times better but still misses, clearly they're a more advanced player as far as game. And, and they may lose that match again and again and again, and the parents are going to get frustrated. Um, what I do is I set up specific skills that the kids have to master and prove that they've completed before they go to the next level. There's rally tempos um, that they, you know, curriculum that they have to meet, there's depth situation they have to meet, there's angles, shots they have to meet, there's consistency parameters they have to meet. And once you, um, once you set up that curriculum where they have to exhibit certain skill sets before they go up, then you, have, you can go to the parent, here's the skill set, when they get through this, we'll put them up to the next level. And part of that may be competition. Maybe they have to win a certain number of matches. Maybe they have to beat a certain number of kids above them to get in. But whatever your parameters are, make it something where the parents can say, this is fair. Because you're, otherwise you're going to get the phone calls at midnight saying, you know, we're leaving the program and this isn't right. And then you're going to get bad mouth all over the place. 
some smart coach who put all that curriculum together <laughs> into like a package. I'd, I'd buy it. I don't know about you guys. Um, well, one more question. One more question. It was, Are sorry. there some things that you've learned from your wife's practice that have been very beneficial? And, and, <laughs> you know, maybe top two or three. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. she's not watching. <laughs> she doesn't think there's anything I learned from my wife's practice. Um, she's been with WGA for almost a year now, uh, dealing with the top 100 players. Um, I think what I've learned is that they're all human, and they have the same human problems that we all have. And the no matter what, what their level of performance is, um, things like my outfit doesn't look good, and I'm feeling the pressure of this relationship that I have at home, or the money pressures, um, those all exist in exactly the same way they would exist for us. But I think the difference is they're very, very good at compartmentalizing those things and putting them on the back burner until or for competition. They've learned how to say, this goes over here, I'm leaving it over here, I will address it later, it still exists, but right now I have to put my time and energy into this thing. And I think their skill set and ability to do that is probably better than most people. Um, they understand how to manage energy and say that this is now practice time, this is now competitive time, and I just don't deal with problems at this moment. Uh, and the second, second thing I see is when they, they're professional in the sense of if I'm a brain surgeon and I'm cutting into someone and I make a mistake, I don't have time to go whine and complain and make excuses. I have to solve the problem. And professionals at the elite level realize that, that moaning and whining and complaining about it is not going to solve the problem and is not going to be effective when it's actually needed. Um, they need to be able to put those emotions aside and solve the problem. And again, that's a skill set that really elite people in all of their fields have. And I think those players are very, very good at doing that. Um, and I think that when we watch the kids at 9, 10, 11 years old, they don't have that skill set yet. And sometimes it never develops. I guess those are probably the biggest two. But the human factor, just reality that I'm not allowed to talk to her about what she learns on tour because you know, it's all private. But we hear a little bit of the stories of these are issues that come up, especially when you watch commentators on TV, you know who's struggling out there. Well, uh, last question. Frank, what's your feeling about on court coaching? You know, the, the women's tour has it, the men's doesn't. And I've heard opposing views as to it, but I, I think it would add something to the game, particularly if it's a one sided match. Maybe a coach could intervene, but I'm just curious what your thoughts on it. Yeah, I'm conflicted about it because there's things that I might say. Uh, to the player if I go out on the court to coach that I kind of don't want the rest of the world knowing because it's all televised and mic'd. So you may be giving away trade secrets that other players may use when they hear you working with your player on that. So what I really think is that the on-court coaching should be allowed at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old in the developmental years. And I know that people say they've got to develop independence and be able to solve problems on their own and figure it out. But I think that's great for 14, 15, 16, 17 when they actually have the skill set to do that. But 10, 11, 12, 13, I think it'd be awesome to have coaching at that level. But that's that's a very disagreed upon topic out there in the tennis world. Yeah. Well, why do they allow it for the women and not the men? I don't know where that I, I think they're experimenting. I, I don't have an answer for it. But it, if you've seen some of the way the coaches approach the women on tour, it, you can see how much of an effect a coach has during a match. Um, they, they deal a lot with psychology. Once in a while it's tactics. But most of the time, it's helping the person kind of solve their emotional issues in that moment and get them ready to compete at a more level balance, if you will. Um, and I think that's instructive to what we do as, as coaches instead of teachers. That it's much more about the psychology of the player and about keeping them stable and then competitive as opposed to letting things affect them. All right. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it was we got outside of our comfort zone and outside of the box a bit, uh, which doesn't happen a lot of times. Um, so thanks for Craig for being here. Appreciate a big hand for Craig. We do a quick hand for, quick hand for Bill actually doing something innovative. We don't see this a lot. Bill's always always cutting edge stuff.